Good afternoon and welcome to Health and Living with me, T. Xiao Yik. We're talking about blood cancers today. Now, healthy blood cells are important for our body to function normally, but for people who have been diagnosed with blood cancers, the production and function of these blood cells are affected. So to help us understand more about the different types of blood cancers and how we, we can treat them, uh, we'll be speaking to Dr. Tengku Ahmad Hidayah, consultant, hematologist and physician from Thompson Hospital, Kota Damansara. If you have any questions for Dr. Tengku, you can call us at 3 Double seven double three two nine hundred. You can WhatsApp us at zero one eight seven eight nine double eight double nine, or you can tweet us at BFM Radio. Good afternoon, Doctor Tengku. How are you Good today? Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> thanks for having me here. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a bit of a serious topic considering um, this is the start of Bulan Ramadan. Yep, maybe. Um, but I think it's important because um, I mean the topic of cancer usually frightens a lot of people but cancer is becoming more common so I think it's it's important to just have a better understanding of what it is and and what are our options when it comes to uh, conditions like this. Um, yep. We're doing a sort of overview um, look at blood cancers today because there are several different types. Um, so perhaps we can start with a general understanding of what are blood cancers. Yep. Blood cancers, uh, the other name is why it is uh, liquid tumour Mm. So um, it's quite a big, uh, this is a big topic. So we'll just have an overview of what um, we're going to talk about yes. today. So when I mention blood cancer, usually it's about leukemia, mm -hmm. lymphoma, multiple myeloma. And there are other smaller, not smaller, rare, rarer. It's mm -hmm. already rare, but there are even more rare types of cancer. They're mouthful. Myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS, right. and myeloproliferative neoplasm, MPN. But we'll focus on the big three. Mm-hmm. Leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma today. Right, right. Okay. And you call them liquid tumours. Yeah, because they're the blood from the blood. It's mm -hmm. a sort of a colloquial term. Um, actually, uh, some American professor labelled it. And it, mm -hmm. for me, at, the, at that time, I thought it was mm, sounded quite interesting. Right. Yeah. So the difference between a blood cancer, or so-called liquid tumour, and other cancers where you have a solid tumour yeah. growing, yeah. Um, if you could explain where the cancer cells originate in, in when it comes to blood cancer. Okay, there's two groups. Um, when we have uh, the blood system is called the hematopoietic system. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll get a bit scientific here. Uh, that's, uh, then after that, the lymphoma comes from the lymphoid system. Mm -hmm. um, your, we'll start with, the, uh, if we talk about blood cancers, the, the one that appears in our blood, we call it leukemia. Mm -hmm. So they start from, from uh, the hematopoietic system. They divide into other types. There's the myeloid type, lymphoid type mm -hmm. so i think i will just uh, um which go we will go into we, we could later. go yeah. into that later then yeah. lymphoma it comes uh, from, from the lymph nodes mm -hmm. and but they may even appear in other we call it extra nodal outside the lymph nodes all right so that's those are atypical presentations of the tumors mm -hmm. yeah and multiple myeloma multiple myeloma is actually a disease it's a subset of um a problem from a lymphoid it's from mm. the, the cell we call it a plasma cell which produces antibodies. So in any cancer, they proliferate. They're not good. They keep proliferating, mm -hmm. but they don't die. So they produce abnormal amounts of antibody, which is not good. How common are blood cancers uh, in Malaysia? They are not too common, but um, they're among the top 10, but it's not top 5 uh, mm -hmm. for sure. So leukemia and lymphoma is um, it's in the top 10, but not multiple myeloma. Right. Yeah. So uh, among the three main ones you've talked about, yeah. leukemia and lymphoma are more common. Yep, leukemia and lymphoma And overall common. blood cancers are just among the top 10. Yeah, among, among top 10, but not okay. the top 10. All right. Um, maybe then we uh, could go into each of these main ones. Um, leukemia, you've talked about it originating in the blood cells. Yeah. Um, what exactly is happening? Um, what are the cancer cells doing? So in leukemia, we'll divide it into two groups. There's acute and chronic. Right. So the acute, we divide further, I'll um, divide it to more general terms, to acute myeloid leukemia, we call it AML. Mm -hmm. Then another type is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the chronic, we divide to chronic myeloid leukemia. Mm -hmm. And the uh, other one is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. All right. So when we talk about acute, um, this is all very, uh, very immature cells. They call it, we call it blast. Mm -hmm. 
So they uh, due to a certain event, uh, genetic abnormality, environmental exposure. Uh, uh, people do ask me. We'll talk about the cause later. Um, they form this many amounts uh, of blast. So in your normal um, marrow, your hematopoietic center, progenitor cell center, you're supposed to have normal amounts but this blast may even go up to 90% mm. and it, it it consumes this marrow space as uh, we say it so it doesn't all your normal other white cells that should be produced get suppressed and that's what happened so uh, they divided into two groups myeloid aml and all right. for chronic they take some more time they pro, uh, uh, like any any cancer as i said the keyword is proliferation mm. without apoptosis without cell death So you so just the cells just keep, keep multiplying. Keep multiplying. They don't die off. Mm. So there's a, a signal that uh, something wrong when happens. So chronic they occur more slowly, indolently, and for both cases of CML and CLL. What factors would determine whether it becomes acute or chronic? Unfortunately, there's no explanation. Mm. The uh, some chronic type of uh, leukemia, leukemia, uh, they suddenly there's some uh, they change into acute they call it blastic transformation right so it becomes uh, when it happens that becomes poor prognosis okay i yeah. see and uh, obviously the differences also would be in terms of how you approach treatment yes, for exactly. acute and chronic yes and 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 they have um, um a different each tumor have its different age group different presentations and different approach in treatment. Mm. And uh, we'll talk about treatment, the, uh, the yes. outlines of treatment later. But just curious to know, um, with blood cancers, do you stage them the same way that you do with solid tumors? Yes. For lymphoma, since it's uh, it's um, sort of still a tissue, lymph node tissue, mm. we you, we stage them. Mm -hmm. We have this uh, classical, we go with basic one, they call it Ann Arbor staging. So we use the diaphragm as the as a sort of uh, cutoff point. Mm -hmm. If lymphoma, one side of the diaphragm, up and below, whether it's just one side up or below, right. it's stage uh, uh, one. And and stage two is, if it's still both above the diaphragm but different groups, mm -hmm. stage two. Right. And stage three will be both sides of the diaphragm, up and below. Stage four will be distant metastasis when it's not a nodal organ. Mm. Just for instance, you have um, uh, liver metastasis lung metastasis so it's already stage 4 by then yeah, for leukemia mm -hmm. it's a bit different because your blood is everywhere that's right we cannot stage it mm -hmm. but we do have um, staging mechanism by uh, based on the um, we prognosticate according to patient's age uh, the white cell at presentation and there are also genetic uh, markers that decides whether it's good or normal or even high risk I see, yeah. I see. And, um, you know, leukemia can also be classified as lymphocytic or um, myelogenous. Myelo myelo myeloblastic. Myelo okay, myeloid, uh, yes. myeloid, myeloid okay. leukemia or lymphoblastic. Leukemia. Ah, so that's the, uh, the two types yes, that you were type. talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, and lymphoma now, um, so as you very briefly already explained, it affects the lymphoids. Yes. So the lymph nodes, it's lymph originating nodes. in the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes yeah. um, actually, maybe a very quick explanation about the role of the lymph nodes okay. in our system. The lymph nodes in the system is the place where your lymphocyte the lymphocyte still is still produced in your um, your bone marrow your hematopoietic system the progenitor cells but it goes to the lymph node for maturation that's where it gets uh, diversified it gets its markers so the whole idea of um, the uh, the uh, your lymph nodes is part it forms part of your immune system mm -hmm. but when a uh, trigger happens they become cancerous so whatever is cancerous they do not They suppress whatever the immune system that you have, mm -hmm. while they, this uh, cancer cells and the products produces abnormal amounts of um, uh, substance that m makes it not good and and. Uh, Since it's yep. cancer, yeah. Um, the lymphatic system um, also deals with uh, drainage. Yeah, um, drainage. Yep. So, um, just say you have an abscess somewhere in the uh, uh, abdomen, you have a lymph node group there. Um, or you have an infection anywhere, you have a lymph node group there which is in charge of mm. of, uh, of uh, helping out the immune system to to beat the 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 infection. For instance, you may have lymph node swelling when you have infection. Uh, uh, you have a bad abscess in your face. Mm -hmm. You may get lymph node swelling at the neck because uh, the neck is uh, we call it reactive lymph node, so it's supposed to attack uh, the the infection and help the immune system to beat right. the infection there. Okay. But in lymphoma, there's no infection. They just 
uh, become big, they become cancerous, right. and they uh, be- they pro- proliferate. Okay, and of course we've heard um, very often people talking about Hodgkin's and yeah. non-Hodgkin's yeah. lymphoma. What are the differences there? So lymphoma, there's two big groups. Yes, um, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin. Um, the Hodgkin lymphoma uh, is the less common one actually. Mm. Um, they are divided to these other two types: classical Hodgkin lymphoma and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin oh, lymphoma. All right. And the classical Hodgkin lymphoma is further divided. Uh, it's going to lecture now. So yeah, there's a lot. In a, lay, a lot in of sub, yeah. Terms. So there's a lot of subsets. So but the 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 best would be classical and this nodular lymphocyte okay. predominant uh, lymphoma. All right. And then, the difference between those two? Um, yes, they have different. We when we identify these cancer cells under the microscope, they have different markers. And um, therefore, different approach to therapy and different prognosis. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so then that's Hodgkin. Hodgkin. Mm. Non-Hodgkin, you divide it into B. There's many ways to divide non-Hodgkins. There's the aggressive type. There's the more indolent type. And uh, when you talk about non-Hodgkin lymphoma, there's a B, B cells. Because where your lymphocytes produce into B cells or T cells and uh, in charge of different types of immune systems. So B cells, the more common one you can uh, hear is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. But, no, uh, but you have also follicular lymphoma. That's under non-Hodgkin. Then T cell, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is not as common. You have the peripheral T cell lymphoma and for so forth. Yeah, so you, that's another group. So each is a big topic. It, it can is, be a topic on its it own. It is. Yeah. And uh, probably not something we want to go into here. Yeah. But but actually, what is the main difference? In ter- is it in terms of presentation You know, between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's? Actually, the presentation is not that different. It's the identification on... Uh, usually, uh, a few years back, when we say, I remember my professor saying, uh, non-Hodgkin is non and no good. Hodgkin mm. is good, but no con- cancer is good. Yeah. But as I go on, um, uh, as we get all these updates, some Hodgkin lymphoma are very uh, stubborn to treat. They, it's very difficult to treat. They keep coming back. They keep relapsing. Mm. Non-Hodgkin lymphomas, um, they, the main difference for us is mainly we look at is the immunohistochemistry, how they look under the microscope with different stains. When we stain it with um, um, chemical preparation, so it looks different and the outcomes are also different. I see. Yeah. Um, and is age of uh, presentation? Exactly. Age of... is um, Hodgkin um, lymphoma. And um, for you talk about leukemia, some, uh, we go back to leukemia, like um, ALL. Uh, is more common in the younger group mm. and they pick at two different uh, parts. For ALL, acute lymphobastic uh, leukemia, they pick at childhood and, and one point at elderly. AML is mainly an elderly disease. Myeloma is an elderly disease. Mm-hmm. CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, is a disease of more young age group mm-hmm. and CLL is disease of more uh, diff- older age group. Yeah. So, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Different yeah. types um, yes. are peaking at different age groups. Yeah. Uh, we will get to myeloma uh, after the break. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Tengku Ahmad Hidayah, consultant, hematologist and physician from Thompson Hospital, Kota Damansara, about blood cancers today. Uh, you can call us if you have a question, 0377332900, WhatsApp us at 018-789-8899 or tweet us at BFM Radio. Um, you know, uh, I'll be getting to to um, an understanding of what is multiple myeloma, as well as uh, what does all this mean to somebody who has a blood cancer? What are the treatment options and what kind of prognosis uh, are we looking at? You're listening to BFM 89.9. Good afternoon and welcome back to Health and Living with me, T. Xiao Ik. I'm speaking to Dr. Tengku Ahmad Hidayat today. He's a consultant, hematologist and physician from Thompson Hospital, Kota Damansara. We are doing sort of an overview of blood cancers. Yes. So that includes um, leukemia, lymphoma and multiple myeloma. Before the break, Dr. Tengku has already explained about uh, the differences between leukemia and lymphoma. They, uh, I guess to a layperson, it could sound the same, but the leukemia or originates in the blood cells, whereas lymphoma affects uh, the uh, lymph nodes. The lymph yeah. nodes lymph that's right. System. And now there's multiple myeloma. Yes. How's that one different? Okay, multiple myeloma. So um, it's actually a product of abnormal plasma cells. Mm-hmm. Plasma cells is derived from the B cells. So um, it proliferates. We'll hear a lot of that word. It doesn't die. Mm-hmm. So, uh, normal plasma cell is used to produce your antibody. 
to fight infection, to ward off infection. Um, but what happened is it produced so many antibodies, um, no good antibodies. Uh, cancerous is a product of a cancer uh, cell and they proliferate in the marrow. So um, they have a very complex pathogenesis and uh, pathophysiology, meaning they have uh, some immune dysregulation. So the outcome of the disease, uh, simply said, it causes uh, renal impairment because this product with this antibody can uh, clog up your uh, your kidneys mm-hmm. among um, uh, uh, one of the cause of uh, renal impairment. It causes, uh, it eats up your bone. And you can see people having uh, abnormal fractures, mean low impact fractures or punch out lesions on the x-ray. Mm-hmm. You may get anemia uh, because um, the bone marrow space is filled by these abnormal cancer cells. You get suppression. And uh, they, um, you may get so that's the whole system. We even call it CRAB. C for calcium, mm-hmm. R for renal, mm-hmm. A for anemia, B is for bone lesions. It's mm-hmm. part of the uh, diagnostic criteria. Right. So you have abnormal plasma cells, abnormal antibodies, and causes a haywire. And the outcome of this, actually, we have not found a cure for it, despite many treatments, but we have found a way to prolong survival. And it is a disease of elderly. So the main aim of the treatment is to prolonged survival for right, these patients. Right, yeah. it does. It does sound um, pretty terrible. Yeah. I mean, um, can, can but it is rare. It's not too common. But sometimes you wonder, people, when you hear people sakit tua, sakit tua, mm-hmm. that you may it makes you wonder why the some malignancies, including multiple, multiple myeloma, myeloma, is one of them. That's just not yeah. recognized. Yes. Um, and speaking of recognizing or identifying blood cancers, I mean, what would be um, the signs that would bring somebody to your attention? Okay. So the common presentation uh, for leukemia is usually an incidental finding of anemia, or even patient feels tired. Anemia means you have low hemoglobin. You feel tired. You can even uh, pass out. You have dizziness. You have all palpitations. Then that's because your HB is uh, affected, your red cells. Red then cells, secondly, yeah. your white cell is affected, your normal white cell. You get fever and infection. And thirdly, your platelet is affected. So you get this abnormal bleeding and bruising. That's a warning sign. Nobody bleeds normally. So you have to, uh, unless it's from uh, normal causes, but you bleed spontaneously or low impact, that's not normal. Mm. Then for, um, the, the, you may get lymph node enlargement in, uh, in, in, in cases like ALL or CLL. You may get spleen or your liver enlargement. And for the lymphoma, you get lymph node swelling. Mm -hmm. You do get this um, liver or spleen enlargement. And there's a uh, symptom called B symptoms. You get this unexplained fever, prolonged fever, more than two weeks. You get night sweats. And um, you have a 10% unintentional weight loss, unless you intend to lose Mm -hmm. your weight. But uh, 10% unintentional weight loss in the space of six months. Mm -hmm. So those are the warning signs. Unintentional, unexplained. Unexplained, um, unintentional uh, weight loss. We have a caller on the line. Uh, Good afternoon, Shen. You have a question. Hello, Shen. Hi, Dr. Dr. Gray. I love what you've been saying so far. Oh, thanks, Shen. I've got a simple question for you. Do I know you, Shen? Sorry? (laughs) Do I know you, Shen? Your question, Shen? Yeah. Okay, this is the first time I've called in ever. Uh, yeah, thanks. I was wondering, because last time there used to be all these things about uh, you could blood cleansing, cleaning your blood. Uh, there was this group that would say they had this chocolate and it, they wanted to clean their blood. I was just wondering whether or not, uh, I, I know for a fact that that doesn't make sense, but is there a, a scientific way to do the same thing that they mentioned as well? You know, right. just wondering that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, okay. Shen. This is the Thanks. first time. First time I heard a chocolate cleansing, uh, blood uh, cleansing chocolate. Is this detox? Detox. You do get people having detox from tea. But blood cleansing, the only way to clean your blood is, you know, having a normal kidney, normal liver. Um, the organs that organs do the job. Do the job. You. So, but you do have. Um, I think there's will there be questions since we are on it already. Uh, blood cleansing, like um, bekam, cupping. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's one way of uh, uh, of of uh, clean, cleaning. But it's mainly traditional, cupping and uh, bekam in Malay. Uh, a lot of say there's the the prophet's teaching, and uh, that's uh, for me. I cannot comment too much about it. Because those are traditional methods and it involves um, uh, sunnah. So I'm not an expert in it, but uh, I have an answer for this. At that time, the best treatment available was cupping and become. Uh, and the prophet went to that. 
So we have advances in treatment now. Mm -hmm. So you go for whatever the best available treatment there is to clean your blood, to treat your cancer or any disease. So that's how I would, I would approach patients and explain to patients that. Can you explain what Bekam uh, is? Bekam is cupping where they actually, there's a lot of cups. There is like sort of vacuum suction. Somehow the mechanism is the, the, you, the uh, blood gets sucked out of it. A lot of people do it. I don't know why. A uh, funny one would be, they say, uh, men does not uh, have periods. So, uh, uh, like, uh, we need to take out our normal blood. But men are not mm. supposed to have periods. Uh, <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> period. Okay, so, yeah. so period, they're not yes. designed to have periods. Yeah, but, so, that's, uh, that's the, a lot of people like to think that. It, it, but I do have a scientific way of uh, uh, cleaning the blood. Uh, we have uh, blood disorders, like in MPN, where the blood gets so thick, I intentionally uh, uh, draw blood out. We took, take out 300 cc's and to bring down the red cell uh, levels because high rate cell can cause stroke or even heart attacks so that's that's another topic altogether mm. so. well Azha on WhatsApp was yeah. asking about Bekam which you have addressed yes. but uh, he also asked about whether there's any scientific basis for Ketum to treat leukemia okay Ketum I have no experience in Ketum uh, but um, but there are I have an. That's another type of um, um, traditional medicine. They get. They call it sabah snake grass. Mm -hmm, A lot right. of patients take it, and uh, we found out there is actually some amount of the conventional chemotherapy is available in that sabah snake grass. But uh, sabah snake grass. But you have to take humongous amounts of it. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have to uh, like eat it like it's lunch, breakfast, dinner. So, it's it's there is some basis uh, of this because any conventional treatment, they start off somewhere tra from traditional uh, treatment. So, uh, maybe this can help you, Azhar. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it may not be Bekam, it may not be Ketum, it could be any other. Yeah. I mean, many um, people, when they've been diagnosed with cancer, they turn to uh, different sources yeah. to, to help them find relief. Yeah. I mean, what is your general advice to patients who are looking at exploring? And I know that many of them are afraid yes. to tell. I, I think it's, 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 it's the fear because one, the first thing I need to do, which we'll talk um, about diagnosing, is doing a bone marrow test. test. The moment they hear bone marrow test, they run away. Mm. And the stigma with chemotherapy is so bad, uh, we don't even have, have to talk about stem cell therapy because the stigma of chemotherapy in their mind, we have chemotherapy, we're, gonna, we're going to die. Uh, but right now, that's, that's the role of doctors. We are there to control the toxicity. Of course, I'm, uh, there, uh, without any doubt, all this treatment, all, all this investigation has its risk, but we are trained and we, we, we know what's going to happen. And we will help the patient along the journey of the treatment. So uh, that's why they, most patients run away because um, I think we also as doctors have to improve our counselling technique, mm -hmm. encourage them mm -hmm. rather than uh, pummel them with fear. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've talked about a bone marrow yes. biopsy for um, diagnosis. Yes. Is it really as scary as it sounds? What, not, what is involved? Uh, that's two. They even um, bone marrow test is where um, they even confuse it with the spinal tap lumbar procedure because anything with tulang belakang anywhere involving uh, the backbone, they're scared of one, of course, uh, uh, paralysis. But this uh, bone marrow aspirate, uh, commonly in adult, we do it on the hip bone, which mm -hmm. is far from the spine, far from uh, any vital organs, far from any any vessels. So the risk of bleeding. And uh, organ injury is still there, but very minuscule. And um, I will try to... It's not the first thing usually I tell patients. I give them time to address the disease first. So I will give them some time before talking about this bone marrow and later treatment. Mm. So I think th we doctors have to be better in our counselling methods in, in how to... Uh, yeah. deal with these patients. And is the bone marrow test the only way, the only method? For leukemia, in... yes. For lymphoma, uh, you do the biopsy. So you need, uh, you can have the surgeons, uh, we can have a help with other colleagues to do the biopsy. It's a whole lymph node biopsy. Look under the microscope, stain it with this, uh, the, this uh, test called immunohistochemistry. Then we get it. Uh, myeloma, myeloma needs bone marrow diagnosis as well. So a lot of when you uh, deal with ca cancers in general, you need in marrow done. In even lymphoma, we do it because we need to stage the disease. Mm. Because if it's in the bone marrow, it's already considered stage four. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about treatment options then. Okay. Um, you know, do we look uh, at blood cancers generally, or do this does each type have its own treatment approach? Each type has its different treatment. Okay. Let's start with uh, leukemia then. Okay. Leukemia, 
So we will divide into risk, low risk and high risk. The acute, uh, I'll tell the good ones first. Uh, the best is, uh, the outcome is for chronic myeloid leukemia. Previously, you require transplant and chemotherapy to treat it. But in, uh, in uh, late 1998, early 2000, a, a, a wonder drug is sort of breakthrough medicine called imatinib. It's an oral medicine. You take it orally and the, survive, and the approach to treatment cancer in general uh, and CML in, and cancer in general has changed. Uh, one of it is due to this, uh, this one, uh, wonder drug, we call it. So you just take it orally and that's, um, the response is up from, from patients having needed trans- transplant with mortality rate up to, uh, uh, with success rate of 20, 30%. It went to up, the update of the study in 2017, that's 80% 10-year survival. When wow. you talk about cancer, 10-year survival, 80% is... Uh, amazing because mm-hmm. you can die means you die of other causes right yeah yes. so yes. that's uh, so that's CML mm-hmm. um, then um, you talk about acute uh, leukemia it's a combination you will require chemotherapy but there are also targeted therapies uh, for instance there's uh, a treatment in in a type of AML called APML it was a very horrible disease before this from uh, close to 90% mortality because of this special vitamin A uh, product, all trans acid, in combination with chemotherapy, the outcome has reversed up mm. to 80 to 90% remission. Right. So this, um, uh, there are more coming, more type of these drugs coming. We are hopeful. And of course, there are some treatment, uh, some uh, type of leukemia, EML, you still have very bad prognosis because you have uh, elderly people who are elderly, high white cell presentation. They have poor outcomes, poor cytogenetics. So we just save who we can and uh, we'll try to support. We'll also select the patients carefully. If a patient is not fit for chemo, we will not give the chemo. So if they are not fit for chemo, what are their options? They are palliative options. Palliative care is a, is a, is a, a lot of people thinking is giving up, but we have uh, learned how to embrace mortality and having quality of life up to the end of life. And um, that's an option. But, but what, that should not mm, be the first option. Mm, means if you have a chance to go for treatment, go for it. Mm, okay. We are talking about blood cancers today with Dr. Tengku Ahmad Hidayat, a consultant hematologist and physician from Ho- Thompson Hospital, Kota Damansara. Uh, when we come back from the break, um, we will look at the treatment options for the other types. Um, we haven't talked about lymphoma and multiple myeloma yet. And also stem cell transplants. Uh, that's yep. a major um, sort of um, a, a treatment treatment approach um, that has uh, uh, has proven to be a cure for some patients. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can call us at 03-7773-2900. You can WhatsApp us at 018-789-8899 or you can tweet us at BFM Radio. We'll be right back on BFM 89.9. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show with me, T. Xiao Eek. I'm speaking to Dr. Tengku Ahmad Hidayah, consultant Hello. hematologist and physician from Thompson Hospital, Kota Damansara today. Uh, we're talking about blood cancers, Dr. Yes. Tengku. Um, you know, we've covered sort of what are the differences between leukemia, lymphoma and multiple myeloma. Uh, those are the three main ones. We've talked about the different uh, sort of um, the the different prognosis because they're broken down into so many specific types. Yes. It, it's hard to get into yep. each of them, isn't it? But we're looking at treatment options and generally it seems that for leukemia and lymphoma, um, there's so much good news yeah. with the modern advances. Yeah. So if yeah. you split it into three, there's chemotherapy, mm-hmm. it's classic chemotherapy, toxic therapy targeted therapies are the uh, if you men- it's not only for uh, blood cancers even for other solid tumor cancers mm-hmm. that's the uh, term now then but with us there's an additional uh, area of treatment called bone marrow transplant or hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplant when I mention stem cell here I uh, refer to the blood stem cell because uh, there's other types of stem cells you hear the, those are called mesenchymal because they are from another progenitor mm-hmm. most uh, I do not want to comment about that and still, since most are still under research but the proven uh, stem cell is um, is hematopoietic or bone marrow transplant okay yeah. and if you could um, help us understand how does a bone marrow transplant work in the treatment of a blood okay. cancer? So, uh, bone marrow transplant we divide it into two. We call it autologous transplant. Autologous transplant means it's from the patient himself or herself. 
Allogenic transplant is from a donor. Usually, it's a sibling, a match donor, but you may have unrelated match donor as well. So, um, the the whole premise will still start with um, the autologous transplant is used in treatment of lymphoma and myeloma in general mm-hmm. as part of the of the whole artillery of um, of uh, uh, treatment in these two types. So, it's almost like a reboot of the system. Uh, because uh, what will what is important is after we control the disease with any treatment, be it chemotherapy or targeted therapy, or in combination, we will collect the stem cell from the patient himself, store it this sort of for reserve, and when we give uh, then the when we go for treatment stem cell, what we give is uh, we call it conditioning chemo, which is a strong chemo. It's sort of very strong chemo, with uh, which will uh, will hopeful to kill off the cancer, but it it will also clear off your bone marrow. Mm-hmm. So that's why after uh, we give them uh, the strong chemo, after a few days, or uh, they will reinfuse the stem cell. The stem cell will smartly home on, home into the bone marrow and start replenishing. And a good outcome you may see even patient after two weeks being discharged mm-hmm. with this autologous. Mm-hmm. When allogenic is a bit different. Because it's mainly uh, reserved for um, for leukemia, um, because the problem with the is the main problem is with the marrow. So in general, we do not want to take the patient's marrow, which is already diseased. Mm-hmm. So you have a donor. So when we have we have this HLA typing, HLA match donor is the best uh, donor. It's usually sibling. Mm-hmm. Uh, a parent cannot because it only have half of your HLA. Right. So uh, the best outcome comes with this. The additional um, benefit of this, it has this graft versus disease effect, meaning the donor's immune system will attack the cancer. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's very um, it's very smart and quite uh, wonderful in a way when you think about it. But it also comes with side effect because apart from because at this point in time you are wiping out the the patient's immune system. And this graft versus um, graft versus uh, disease effect may come up with other problem where it attack the healthy organs. We call it the graft versus host disease. So this may affect the liver, the 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 uh, the skin, the the tract. But don't worry, we have the medication to to control this. Even despite medication complications may occur, but that's where we uh, the hematologist will be there to guide the treatment. And control uh, control um, the disease and as well as the, the the side effects of the treatment. What is the prognosis after a stem cell transplant? So, um, usually, the the is different disease is different prognosis. Of course, the 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 leukemia is still not as good as lymphoma. But when we talk about when we we tell the chances to the patient, uh, we are hoping to get even eighty percent uh, remission rate. With the the treatment and less than twenty or less than ten to twenty percent mortality or morbidity means the side effect, um, but some disease are so horrible because when patient has leukemia, they already have they already not um uh, good to begin with. Some of them may get um infections in and out. They already have the disease and they themselves are not that fit. So selection of patients to go for transplant is also another important criteria. Yeah, so how do you decide who is a suitable patient okay, for transplant? Is the disease itself. Some disease without transplant will relapse for sure. Uh, within five years or even within two to three years, it will relapse for some acute leukemia. So we have that's why we have that risk prognostication. Some may not. We have a watch and wait policy, so we do not transplant. And um, in then um, those with bad cytogenetic profile, poor risk, we transplant up front. But in lymphoma in general, we do not transplant up front because uh, we, uh, most of the lymphoma will uh, be in remission, but we only reserve uh, the transplant for patients who are refractory, not responding to treatment, uh, meaning needing other salvage treatment or those patients who, re- who relapse. So those kind of patients will need transplant, autologous transplant for this patient. Okay. Because they will want effect of the chemo, the strong chemo, to, to wipe out the cancer as much as possible. Would you say that a transplant has the best outcomes for younger um, patients? Yes, because they are more fit, 
um and and uh, they don't have comorbidities because the older patients um is uh, they have other problems like diabetes hypertension and uh, actually some transplant centers have a cut off point for uh, for allogenic means uh, for allogenic from other sources mm-hmm. 60 years old and for autologous self trans uh, self uh, your self stem cell is 65 years old mm-hmm. those are in the government centers i'm not sure about the other centers in the private okay we have a question on whatsapp um me says I'm I'm 23, yeah. um, stage 3 Hodgkin's lymphoma after chemo remission um, for the past 3 years. Okay. Um, I'm not taking any vitamins or anything. What would you recommend me to take? First, congratulations to me. You're a survivor. 3 mm-hmm. years is good. You take every year as it comes. Mm-hmm. Um, you just eat healthy food. <laughs> eat healthy food. You want to take supplementary vitamins. Um, it's good. Go ahead. Uh, but you do not take any additional um, supplements or, or those that are not really accredited from accredited sources. They may want to help you. Some family may even offer you all this, but I know their intention is good, but they may not know because it can affect your liver, it can affect your kidney. Because if you have an uh, impaired liver, kidney, and uh, heaven forbid your disease relapse, It's not good because uh, the chemo and 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 uh, chemo therapy and all the complications may affect the kidney and the liver. So if you don't have good liver or kidney to begin with, then it's poor prognosis. And um and as I said, take it as uh, you're young. There's a lot ahead of you. Uh, and take it as a uh, five year. Then I take it ten years. So congratulations. Yes. Um. Yeah. But also on that note, um. You know what? How do you advise patients about the risk of um? Uh, relapse. Okay. Uh, once the patient's uh, in remission, um, we will follow them up. Um, usually, frequently for a f- few months. Then after that, three monthly, we'll educate the patients at any signs of uh, the disease coming back. As I mentioned earlier, those symptoms to come immediately. Uh, to us, um, most uh, hematology centers we have an open door policy. Our old patients can just walk in and have a check. Mm. So um, and do not hesitate uh, to come back to the doctors. Especially those who has treated them, because they have will have all the records. But yeah. what what are the treatment options for somebody who relapses? They have a second line chemotherapy. Then you have the targeted therapies. So uh, because targeted therapy is very expensive, and it's still in under development. So usually the first line, even in you look at the European British um, uh, guidelines, uh, they they most of them still um, go for the first line chemotherapy because it's been proven. We reserve those poor prognosis, those those relapse for uh for those who are relapsing or refractory. Okay, yeah. all right, and um you know for patients who have undergone the stem cell transplants, yes, um a, re- a relapse um is still is there a very there's very still s- a s- small still, I, when we counsel patient there's still small even after going through all that. Uh, the uh, the journey of the whole chemotherapy transplant it still can come back. So we even um, most clinics in hematology units they have a specific stem cell clinics transplant clinic to follow up on this patient, and um, we we, they, we follow them lifelong. But again, you know, if if you've already done and that's the, the reboot of the system, system, right? System, what can so you do after that? Targeted therapies, right? So for especially autologous who has uh, relapsed, there's sometimes allogenic. Because if your own immune system is not good enough, there's a but it doesn't apply to all. It's not a one blanket rule. Right. Yeah. Okay. And um, I I was reading, and I don't know how common this is that some cancer treatments in themselves are so harsh that they can actually lead to a second um, cancer, and that could be the case with uh, AML, acute myeloid yep. leukemia. Um, What are the chances of that? You may have um, once you get um, treatment with cytotoxic chemotherapy. There's always um, there's always a chance of the disease, uh, another type of cancer. So um, even radiotherapy, uh, you may get secondary cancers. So cytotoxic chem- uh, therapy, for instance, I, we treat you for lymphoma. There's a chance in the future that you may get uh, leukemia or a- other types of cancer in the future. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question from Izad. I'll just uh, quickly take this call. Um, good afternoon, Izad. You have a question. Hi, hi, uh, doctor. Uh, Izad Halimi here. Hi, Izad. One thing to know, uh, because I hear that people say that um, if you have cancer and you stop taking sugar, it will help to reduce the growth of the cancer. Is it true? Okay. Okay. Thank you very thank much you. for your question, Izad. So sugar is not good in general. So uh, you do not. Uh, sugar 
of course it comes with all other health problems but there's no proven uh, uh, link. link to say sugar and cancers especially when i talk about my leukemia um, but you do have this uptake in of sugar in in in, in lymphoma because your cancer will consume uh whatever nutrients you take mm-hmm. so you're including your sugar mm-hmm. so when you actually we do a pet scan of a patient lymphoma it actually is actually uh, it's a scan of this radioactive sugar it will light up but don't forget you your body still need sugar it still need carbohydrate so uh don't stop taking sugar you just take healthy amounts of sugar as mm-hmm. as uh, as it, as it is um and uh, but everything in moderation oh, yeah. right exactly. um it's not just cancer yeah. that that sugar will have an impact so I'll on, extend yeah. on that some people may, may not even take protein mm-hmm. daging meat in, because, with, for we, fear we, that it will cancer, feed the cancer. cancer but you know you need you need to be, uh, yourself to be in good uh, good nutritional status to fight the cancer because the chemotherapy alone does not uh, is not enough your the body itself must be be in optimal condition for so treatment. like you said just now just eat healthily, eat, healthily. Um, eat well yes, um, yep. eat a balanced yes, uh, diet exactly. um, do you have a final message about blood cancers my final message will be do not uh, once it may come uh, without warning if a patient gets diagnosed or a relative gets diagnosed seek the doctor listen to the options and do not run away from investigation or treatment because you may come in even in worse condition as when you were first diagnosed Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've been speaking to Dr. Tengku Ahmad Hidayat, consultant haematologist and thank physician you. from Thompson Hospital, Kota Damansara, about blood cancers. You've been listening to Health and Living on a Bigger Picture, BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.